in, in terms of traditional crafts when you're coming into a more con um, commercial market. They, they call this like simplification because yeah, it's, made, it's faster to produce and it's more economic. So next slide, please. So this is just a composite of the whole process that um, I went through with this particular piece. Um, it, like I said, it's very important. There are three things, color, pattern, and use. And I think this is largely because of my background in research, but I think this is something that a lot of designers and artists go through. It's a thoughtful process. The process of creation is a very thoughtful process. Um, my aunt often says that the, one of the major purposes of design is to solve a problem. And in art, it's almost the same thing. You're solving a problem, which sometimes it's intrinsic. It's your problem because you have to find a solution to your light bulb moment. Oh, I want to do this, but how do I do it? So in between that light bulb moment and that, ta-da, it's there, you go through a lot of different steps. And for me, it's very, let's call it what it is. It's kind of anal because I do a lot of research. Um, so last slide. So this is the finished product. Um, this is uh, a piece that I did um, on the Sipotangan. Um, it incorporates all those factors. All of the patterns are based on different versions of the Sipotangan that I looked at, researched from picture, actual thing. Um, and also I incorporated the use by keeping that area blank um, so that you can actually have an idea. I don't know if you can really see it, but um, an image incorporated in the very center of it. So, and then the other, the flip side to it, um, when you do a lot of research, textiles in the Philippines, um, there's two, there's a lot of versions, but there's two ways to look at them sometimes. Um, a lot of the textiles in the Philippines, particularly the traditional, are ritual based. Um, they, they're very deep in meaning, and there's a lot of ceremony that go with them. And as a student of, Philippine studies, Philippine culture, Philippine history. You don't want to tread on that. I personally don't want to tread on that. So there's also a difference in how I approach the head cloth, which is more or less commercialized. It's used by the people, meaning, but it's not associated to ritual, not necessarily. Um, but when I, the next piece in the next slide, is the Tiboli Kumo, which is very ritualized. It's, it's very, in a sense, it's very sacred. There's a lot of meaning attached to it. There's a lot of taboo attached to it. Even the whole process of creating or um, extracting abaca. Oh, I did that. Almost that. So here, my approach is a little bit different. There's not a lot of breakdown. If you, the last slide, actually, I want my last slide. Yay, I made it. Um, the patterns are whole. Unlike the Seputangan, um, the patterns are broken down. But with the Tiboli Kumo, the patterns are whole. So I think, um, so just to finish, because I have like, what, two minutes left. Um, for me, a lot of research really has to go into um, how we think about how we approach art and design, especially if we're, de we're dealing with um, cultural aspects of Philippine culture. Because... While we are ideally contemporizing certain aspects of culture so that they can be appreciated or consumed by a bigger population, we also have to be careful about certain elements, not to overtake that meaning and not to over in a sense. So I, I'm hoping that I'm gonna be able to do that, but that, that's one of the things that research um, and reading about helps me do so. There. Thank you. Thank you, Amihan. Um, and for our last speaker, um, Ms. Christina Taralba.
Yes, that's it. Okay. That's my cover page. Maybe we can go on to the... Okay. Uh, I started off with this intro to a book called Architectura Filipino, which was undertaken by one of my former students. And I encourage him to, to really get us through this. And if you know, the, I, I started this on putting it together for him. It's a layout of how he's going to uh, do the book so that there is a better uh, appreciation of Filipino architecture. And architecture is what I believe. I believe it's a conveyance of the past to the future. It's something that you give to the future. Because architecture is permanent. And I would remember uh, talking to some architects like, you can erase most of the artworks that you're working on and change your mind, and you can reconfigure it. But there's something that once you have come to a concept to follow, then you can never erase that. If you do a good piece of architecture, well and good. It's a trophy. But then if you make a mistake, it is forever staring at you in the face, all the ugliness and all the defects of a structure. And uh, what happened in the Philippines, this is uh, actually in line of Filipino architecture because it's only like about 15, 20 years ago that we started in UP to start looking for what is Filipino architecture. And uh, I started it with doing a survey, just uh, cataloging, putting together a whole listing of different architecture, different times, different uses, as far north as uh, Batanes and down south as Bongao. And we were able to amass something like about 1,500 uh, different structures all over the Philippines that dates back beyond 50 to 100 years old. And we were able to put together a database of 1,500 pieces of architecture of that age. But the saddest thing that happened this was in year 2000 when we started it. By 2005, it again, somebody, some of my students took over the process of documenting. And I said, can you start checking what's happening to them? And we found out that a good 40% have been wiped out already. They're no longer in existence. And now, culture of architecture is And um, when you go all over the country, at that point in time, nobody knew what is Filipino architecture. They think their Bahay Kubo is Filipino architecture. Well, yes. Yes and no. But it was something much more than that. And in our consolidation, Look, from the pre-colonial period to the Spanish period to the American period, look at the houses. Houses is so close to the people. It bespeaks of your culture. Okay? And now, when you look at the form, it has not really changed. The Bahay Kubo, it's small. You have the Bahay na Bato. It's made out of Bato and all that. But in the basic areas of a piece of architecture, it is replicated in the different types that are being built for a period, but in essence, they are still the same. And even up to now, you can see good architecture that still explains what is Filipino architecture. And this is actually a product of really very generous in spaces, very open. We put doors, but we keep our doors open. Up to now, this still goes on. And so you can see this 
individuality of the Filipino that has replicated itself no matter from what part of the Philippines do they come from. They still would be led by their culture. And so we move on. Uh, our ancestors, of course, they had to grapple with the usual. We still have that now. The different disasters that we're talking about. The Ibatans were able to bury their houses. They don't have the lower floor and upper floor, but it's something that you see from the outside. Inside, they have excavated the lower portion where they keep it as storage. And during the colder months, they would have a cooking house, they call it. And they stay there during the cooler months like November, December, January, February. And they sleep around the cooking house because there's always fire there and they dry their vegetables, they dry their fish, their meat. So this is where they live. They don't live in the main house. And I think that thing is still ongoing right now. And also, uh, they found out that these Filipinos, we, we are very meek. We are meek, but very hard-headed. You cannot force them to do anything. Yes, they will tell you. They would be very gracious, accepting. Yes, we'll do it this way. Okay, we'll do it this way. Deep within, in the end, when they come out with something, it's something that is uniquely their own, even in architecture. Next. Uh, so this is a backgrounder of what architecture. Now, you would notice that there is such a big gap between the other arts and architecture because it is now defined as a profession. The profession is warranted because it's important safeguarding life, uh, health, property, and public welfare. So you have, uh, this is an art, uh, art experience wherein you can be um, you can be sued for this for this if it would break any of those things at the bottom if you hurt people if you uh, create unhealthy environment property welfare and so what happens here now is that you become more contrived in designing an architectural piece, okay? Because you have to safeguard and you should be able to give certain things that are not really specifically being given by the arts. And so you are asked to have a license and you can have a case against you for you know, hurting people or uh, destroying things. So it becomes a profession. And this is where uh, we come into a situation where we don't now think of architecture. There's another layer that has come in recently, which is urban design. Urban design and architecture. Because at the rate that our centers are growing it is hard to distinguish what is architecture and what is urban design because you would have to think of continuity of lines continuity of uh, function you have to have make room for other people and you have to fit them in in an essence of art uh, so we have uh, I became part of this. This was put together by Hall Sim Foundation. We were talking about sustainable architecture and sustainable construction. It started as sustainable construction. And if you would notice, you have these five things. But the one that would tie it up all together would be the lowest portion, which, which is the contextual aesthetic impact that is most important it should have a high 
when you talk of high architectural quality, it is not just giving, you know, an abode for creating spaces for a lot of people or uh, you create spaces for things that goes on inside. You have to think about it. How many people would be using this? How would it be used? How would you make it effective? And again, there are a lot of essential things that are in the art that has to be put in together in order to have a successful piece of architecture. And so, if you know this year, you have quantum change and transferability. So we look forward to certain changes. But these changes should be a change for the better. And here now you have ethical standards and social equity also. So that you don't put a very, very tall building next to a regular residence. But then these things keep on going because the, 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 the essence of urban design has been totally forgotten. You know, each architect would like to create his own uh, statue, his own trophy, and they don't seem to think of the continuity of the line. And it's sad because once upon a time, the Philippines was, uh, that's not the Philippines, Manila was supposed to have been called in some papers as the Paris of the Orient because of the beautiful buildings at that point in time. And during that point in time, after, the, after that, a lot of Filipinos were brought to the, to the Western world as pensionados so that they would immerse in what we know now as the architecture that they have taken up during that time. Next. Okay. Now, I am showing you two projects that we have come across. One is the Avignon Tower. Uh, uh, I, with a group, okay, has uh, done this in the 19, late 1970s when everything was uh, following other forms of architecture. And I said, why can't we not do away with the, you know, the rectangular things, square them off? But you can, you can mold them into a form that is useful, you know, and something pleasing to the eye. And there's uh, order, there's, uh, way of inventing things, putting it together, because now you have other values that have come up. There are philosophies, economics, politics, technology, and aesthetics of architecture has gone through a lot of, there it is, radical transformation. It is something that you will be looking forward, that transformation. But having gone through all the architecture of the different periods, you would notice that the transformation may be the external features or additional spaces. Like during the Spanish period, you have a lot of churches, you have a lot of uh, uh, other institutions that are really more for a smaller community of trying to inform the people of how to live together. Because the early Filipinos used to have their own little clan somewhere and they have their own area where they have their food, they have their, where they get uh, their daily meals, and, and they have their own practices. But then when the Spaniards came in, they wanted the people to be within the uh, mandate of the King of Spain, to live together, bajo la campaña. So they were taught to live in a community. But the Filipino basically has not evolved from that community that you live alone already because of the lack of spaces. But then when you enter the, the marginalized area right now, if you see them, they would have a replication of what it was even before the Spaniards came. You know, they, they live together. Usually the, the science will be grouped together 
the Ilocanas will be living together. And when you move them into a multi-level, clean, antiseptic building, somehow they would manage to sell their unit and go back to the neighborhood unit. So we cannot seem to find, at the moment, a solution for our marginalized environment because they are replicating a certain culture that we have grown up with. So it replicates itself. So again, now there has been a change. You see, I was talking about the licensure, which really clamps your hands down that you have to follow certain procedures but you can work around that and it was so obvious actually in the 70s when we had a lot of architects during that time like uh, architect Loxin, you have uh, all this uh, uh, you have all these uh, architects who are pensionados and uh, we have a whole lot of beautiful buildings around during that time. And the architects during that time were allowed to design what they feel is right for a certain area. But then it has come to a point when the whole city was getting filled up. And unfortunately, it should have been a mega city that has been organized as one entity. We have Quezon City as one area with with Makati and all the surrounding areas when we had the uh, Metro Manila Commission. When you had one governor and one manager for the whole thing, because a city cannot be subdivided, much more a mega city. Yes, you can subdivide them into names, but not in management. And so it distracts you from the whole procedure. And so when politics comes in, this is a very big change in the future. Because before, uh, traffic and uh, uh, walkways and all that, and uh, you have traffic and uh, utilities of water and drainage and all these things that are happening has to be integrated as one whole. But when it was subdivided into political units, each one are individual marginalized area, unfortunately. Marginalized because it has not achieved. Yes, you have beautiful centers right now, but it's so sad to see this disparity between the with the organized, organized by Western standard, that we have the cities and rational, no? But then you cannot just close your eyes to the marginalized areas that are on the fringes. What do we do with them? But they have come to build their own architecture. And if you just take their picture in black and white and try to color them, the artist, you have paintings of them. You would see how exciting, how exciting is the mix of their own architecture that they have built. This is something that they like. They, they, they could not seem to adjust and you start transporting people out of the city, away from where they want to be, where you have to be together. So there has to be a common ground for that. Those are the things that have to be understood by architecture. And as uh, we have been looking at this, now there is a move, like for myself, I find it very fulfilling to be working out of the urbanized center and creating areas out of the urbanized center into, we call them resort communities. But actually, it is... It is not a resort community. It is a, another community that has all the amenities of open space, air, no pollution, like uh, what we did in, in Nipa. I think we have uh, students here from Batangas. They have an excellent 
area with clean air and uh, all the amenities that you want to have. You have clean water, you have a good uh, mountain behind you. And what we did in the place was not to move the total configuration of the land. We did not want to touch the configuration of the land. And that is how the golf course came about. We said, oh, we can have a golf course because of the configuration and have all the residences around it and within it. It's not segregating the residential area from the play area. The play area is part of the residential area. And so people start to gravitate towards that. We identified those lakes are not natural lakes. They are the lowest part of the land before. And we turned them into irrigation lakes. So as an architect, you can be an artist. It is so fulfilling to do this on a bigger scale because sometimes you don't realize that, hey, we can do this, why not? Okay, so we, we, we dug it a little deeper and we have five lakes within the 200 hectare property. And in between, you have residential areas whose residents now are always complaining that they have golf balls in their yard. And we said, if, if you want to stay in a place like this, you have to suffer the golf balls. But then you have clean air, you have no flooding. No flooding because there was a, an elevation of 40 meters between one end of the property to the other side. So there was a natural flow that would bring out all the excess water to the nearest uh, river. So again, this is the challenge of those who are into architecture. It is for you to be able to transform a natural area into something that is livable and acceptable and making people more human to be staying in there. Then you realize that, hey, I'm a human being, that I have air, I have clean air, I have greens around me. And unfortunately, we have these fake walls of plants and occasionally they would die out. I said, how can you torture plants in a cement world, you know, hardscape? Ar architecture is always uh, related to hardscape. But that's not true. You can have open areas. You can create your own open areas. You can just see also the culture of the people. Why is the airport so clogged up? They're clogged up by people who bring in people to the airport. Why does a whole jeepney of relatives have to be with somebody leaving? But then most of my friends who are from other countries, they said, this is the most heartwarming thing that we see, that when people come to greet you as a whole group, that's what we are. We like to relate. We like to be among ourselves and greet you. And, you know, you have that essence of we will miss you if you are leaving. We are the most homesick race in the world, even though we are all over the world, the Filipinos are always homesick, okay? So again, these are things that unfortunately, architects don't seem to understand. That the reason why that you have all this inventiveness that are going on right now, you have this uh, global city, you have all this, uh, but I am afraid that one day when something happens in the future and we become part of the heritage, the next generation will be able to unearth only malls. Would you believe that there are no more spaces for malls in most of the urban areas around the country? 
because everything are mall. And one of the most human thing that had happened because of the mall is the shop houses are gone. Shop houses, that's part, that's, that's a Filipino home. You know, the upper floor is where they live. They work downstairs. They watch their children grow. They teach their children their art or whatever they're working on. Gone. You can't do this in a mall. But this is the culture. And somehow there are places still that still do this. And it is quite heartwarming to see them defy. Like in Quiapo, they have a big fight over a tall building coming up next to a beautiful old house. But what can you do? That's the law. And there's one thing that is most, uh, I think something that really scares me right now. The concept of uh, corporate practice in architecture. You can be a corporation and you work, you do the toilet, I do the living room, you do the lobby, I'll do the penthouse. And so you have this whole hodgepodge of spaces. And your neighbor, you don't even know who they are. And so, again, this is the other challenge to architecture. And I've seen this deteriorating. A few years ago, I retired from teaching. I've been teaching for 30 years in UP. And I've been practicing right after high school. In my second year in college, I was already working as an apprentice. So I really like the, the romance of creating stone, cement, wood into something that can be a haven for a person or for a group of people. It's something when they go out and say, hey, it's well, I mean, say the air conditioning is good. It's... Uh, hitting you, not in the face, but, you know, it just makes the room cooler, you know. This is technology coming in, but then as an architect, you have, you can do this. You can, you can really actually manipulate how people will act with your architecture unknowingly. Because when you put a door there, no way will they pass through the wall. They would have to pass through the door. So you... You manipulate a lot of people. You do a lot of things within one space. And that is one of the things that you create. Unknowingly, those architects don't seem to understand that these are things that should be understood. It was uh, five years before I, I retired. I, I started to be sad because every child that comes in as freshman, 90% that I have uh, talked to, I would ask them, why are you taking up architecture? Most of the time before, they would answer, oh, so I can maybe design a building, maybe design my parents' house, or design something that is unusual. And, you know, they have these dreams of creating something new. On that five years of my last years in UP, all I heard from students was, this is a course that when you start off, you start off with a better salary than most professions. You don't spend too much for the training, but then when you work, you get a lot of money out of this. So it's, it's a commercial value of architecture that is deteriorating the artistic side of what it is. What the architect, the designer would like to share on a bigger group of people. So with that, uh, this line that I place, it harnessed multicultural inventiveness that is now transformed into generic structures, no memories of the past, nor deliver a gift to the future. This piece of 
uh, line that I put in here was something like 20 years ago. And it is happening now. So, especially with the growth of this corporate activities in the art, it models the whole thing now. It is no longer from the soul, but it is from the point of view of something that is So with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alba. Um, we just have a few minutes now for questions. Some, you can take some questions from the audience. Um, but before that, I just have um, a question for all of you. And one thing that I that I gleaned from all of your presentations is this advocacy for traditional art and culture. Um, why, do you, why do you think it's important for young artists and designers today to know about the past? And how do you make it relevant for, for the contemporary times? Maybe we'll start with Patisse. How do you make contemporary relevant? Well, <clears throat> I think to know the past is a good discipline. You cannot copy the past, but you can be um, influenced. And as Tina was saying, um, community, traditions form what we are. So if you want to do America, American style stuff, go to America. You know, we're Filipinos and we've forgotten that we are Filipinos. The global thing has come to a point which is weird and funny um, where people are looking for their identities and they don't know who they are. As Tina said, it's what we eat, what we, where we live. And I'm a great advocate of that. When I was young, I studied in the States, but I always wanted to do Filipino things, uh, learn Filipino cooking, stuff like that. It's, it's what makes us what we are. And I think that's really important. And it makes you the artist and the developer and the contemporary design. As I said, I make, um, I make a Filipino, I have a, a drawing where I made a Lola riding a motorcycle in her barot saya. You know, it's today. It's today. You can't have a Lola, uh, you know, just cooking because many Lolas don't cook. You know, so you, you put this all together and that's how you make it contemporary. Uh, yes, it's important for us to have that collective memory. I think that is the one that is being uh, dissipated. It's, it's slowly fading away. Before, there is a collective memory of keeping, oh, this is the gown of my Lola. This is the the house of my uncle and so forth and so on. There are benchmarks because somehow in the spaces that you see from the beginning, the Bahay Kubo, it's always a lot of family inter uh, interaction. That's your, your, your Bahay Kubo. But as you grow, bigger you have of course the kaida and you have other bigger spaces but then again the dining room is always so huge it means to say that the people would have to have lunch dinner or breakfast together right so there is this continuous bonding and if the next generation goes into an old house and say why do they always have a party no, families are big, 
and they all eat together. And whenever you stand up, which is a rule in the house, if you stand up during a meal, you would say, excuse me, may I be excused? I have to go out. You ask permission, not you know, just jump in, eat, and like uh, you're in a, uh, what do you call this, cafeteria style, no. So you're all together and you know all your cousins, you know your aunties and uncles and all that. Because you are, the, the house is a way of putting you all together. And even during the American period, during the American period, we were introduced into newer forms of architecture. Not only houses, but we had hospitals, we have uh, hygienic areas that was brought to us. Toilets were brought in during the American period. And so many things. But then when you go in, of course, you have that open space in the ground floor. But usually, they congregate always on the second floor where they would play together and all the rooms open to one big area where they get together. So looking at the, the morphology of the structures from the early times all the way up to the American period and until the 70s and early 80s, most homes are built like that. Even the bungalows that we have or what they call the chalet, they call them chalet, <laughs> the chalet, okay. Remember the chalet? Yeah, the chalet. They would have that front area with a, what's that? You have a, a sort of a big open space and you watch everybody passing through the road and there would be a lola or a lolo sitting on the, on the porch. And, you know, it would be rocking chair and all that. And also as a... It was already when we had, I had an uncle who had a house in Del Air. We built him a house and he wanted that, uh, uh, that patio in front where he can put his uh, rocking chair. And then we noticed that he was in his calzoncillo. And we said, uncle, you're in your underwear. He said, I don't care. Uncle, you're here in Bel Air. You cannot be rocking chair and putting up your feet on one leg of the rocking chair, you know? Remember? You have a long chair. And you, you, you're carrying your custom seat. And he said, I earned enough to be sitting here the way I like to. So, sorry. <laughs> That's a whole story of uh, living in the past. But then, there such was a very rapid transformation after the turn of the century, year 2000. Everything was so fast. Everything was transforming. There were new things to deal with. There were so many things that were not in place. And now, I feel that the quality of our architecture, sadly, I feel sad, very sad, because I have seen it transform. I was born in 1943, and in the 50s, you would see the transformation, little by little, it grows. It's like a plant, you know, and then it blooms. But now it, it blooms, but it blooms only in certain areas, and not as the whole area when it was like that in the past and when you show pictures of this scenery before they would say why can't we not do this now that's a big question now in architecture and in urban design um for me really it's it's very important to consider the past like traditions in the past because like because tradition is an evolutionary process this is um Basically, um, tradition is built upon the adaptation over generations of generations of generations. And I think it's, it's, it's going to be a shame if we forget um, what has gone in the past. And I think tradition builds connections, not just in families, but also in a bigger um, community scale, not just small communities, but as a nation as well. Um, like what you're saying that... Um, this is a common in the talks, like certain things are disappearing, shop houses, uh, the renge technique, 
And um, in the textiles, most of the textiles that I've studied are almost gone. But as you can see, there's so much potential in it. And it doesn't have to be like, like we don't have to copy each tradition, but I think one of the, one of the quotes that's been like um, in my head for the past few months is that a healthy tradition is one that adapts to current needs. And while we shouldn't really live in the past, we should connect to our past to, like, to bring it into the future in a more um, meaningful way. Would, thank you. Um, are there questions from the audience? Yes? Uh, I want to direct this question to Ms. Patti Tesoro. And um, this is about fashion, Philippine fashion. Um, based on my, um, my observation, Philippine fashion is, you know, not not that distinct much. When you bring it to, you know, to other countries, well, what do you think about? What do you think? Do you believe that um, incorporating our tradition will give future to Philippine fashion, or will catapult it to, you know, to you know, Parisian thing, or? Will it be something that is relevant in the future and give us this Filipino identity? And I want to I want to hear your opinion about you know youth um, trying to make Filipino culture relevant through fashion. And um, I want you to say something about our what we wear with the lack of cultural relevance or cultural manifestation. Oh, that's a lot of questions. Yes, a Philippine fashion. We have always we have our identity. Pinya is our identity. Cotton, the Kalingas used to weave it. Uh, all over the Philippines, we have Philippine cotton before. We've lost it, but we're trying to revive it. And if you're thinking that we lack um, skills in continuing this. Yes, I told you in my talk that I'm having a harder time now to find people to do hand embroidery or even simple stitching than before because people have lost it. You lose one generation of embroiderers, you lose three generations. You won't have it. And it's being lost. What to do about it? I now am trying to look for embroiderers, but their, uh, what do you call that, background? I said, I don't like noisy ones. I don't like want people, uh, persons who wear makeup. Uh, because it shows the personality. I like quiet. I like people who like quiet. You know why? Because embroidery is a quiet, pastime. You can't be talking and talking and talking and embroidering. You're focused or your stitches are lost. Even in Dumban, they're not getting the young ones. The young ones now like only calado. What is calado? It's this uh, lace stuff. But they won't even make the small ones. They won't, it's about that big, two inches. And I'm going, wow. It's the, um, the ones that, um, that still do alzado, which is satin stitch. Why do you need quiet for satin stitch? Because your petals, let's just say a petal, you can't have um, a funny looking petal. And if you're talking and talking, you won't have it. Yeah? So we really need to uh, look into this situation. I think there should be a return of the convent or at least of the, the, the teachers I, I really do, because, uh, you know, the past, 